C-A-M-P-O-S. All right. So, uh, who wants to chair this meeting in just that? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and we will call the, is, is the recording equipment working? Okay. So we will go ahead and call the uh, public property meeting to order, and I believe our first presentation is from Jonathan Jones, and Nick, I'll let you do the introductions. Yeah, and thank you, uh, gentlemen, for coming. If we want to do introductions uh, real quick, Lisa, if you just want to go around the table and introduce everybody. I'm Lisa Stone. I work with DCD. Rob Kutansu. And Beck Ashby, and the three of us are council members. I'm Fred Chang. Okay. <coughs> Mark Morris, public works director. Elle Davis, planning. And Nick Bond, I'm the development director. Brandy I'm Charlie Scott, landscape architect with Jones and Jones. Mario Campos, with Jones and Jones. Okay, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming. Um, the reason that this item is on the agenda is that we sent out a request for qualifications uh, back at the end of September. Um, we sent it to five firms, and Jones and Jones was the only uh, group that submitted a proposal uh, or a, a statement of qualifications, I should say, um, and. This morning, we're only required under procurement of architectural and engineering services to interview uh, one firm. Um, as the only firm that submitted, we wanted to give them an opportunity to present their qualifications, and then the committee could ultimately make a recommendation on entering contract negotiations uh, and proceeding with uh, this project. Or uh, for some reason, you don't like what you see, you also have the option to uh, solicit you know, uh, another firm or two to compare to. But uh, at this point, I've reviewed the statement of qualifications submitted. I find them very well qualified. And uh, given their background with the project, I think they would be uh, qualified to do the work. And we'd just like to hear from you, uh, just as sort of a, a reintroduction, since we haven't worked with you for probably five or six years now, and uh, get to know about your approach to the project and also the team that you've assembled. Okay. Before Mario says a few introductory remarks, I brought some additional copies of this ball statement I can distribute to the same thing we got. Yeah, yeah, so probably. So, yeah, You're one and I, yeah. Just about fancy bindings. <laughs> if you want to hand a couple to me, I'll uh, give some to the audience that uh, are here. There you go. I want to to your stable copy of Thank you. you know, and, and then Nick said you might need some explanations. So it's better to be prepared to just you know, talk you through this if, in case you have questions. Um, particularly, I guess, um, we have some sub-consultants, not too many, but we put here people who think we may need. So there could be questions about that, but we can also go on the scope in very general terms. And then we'll enter the negotiations as to what it is that we need to do. We did the master plan, um, and then um, we had quite a bit of uh, process, I think, with meetings, with um, input from community. I mean, uh, at the time, I was the principal in charge, and I remember going through, uh, through that. And then um, I guess it was a small phase that was implemented. Recently, I got the invite to the uh, opening. Um, but, you know, we struggle a little bit with uh, keeping the balance between what's a park and, and playground and very formal versus the very natural uh, part of the park and, and defining some, some nature paths and fitness. People were really interested in fitness and perhaps having some uh, areas for uh, some fitness stations or some commons area to make it more sort of a gathering place for the community. Some meadow, picnics, a lot of areas to be protected, and, uh, and perhaps linkages with, with, uh, with the bridge. It says suspension bridge, but it could be any type of bridge. I guess this is a time to evaluate what's the appropriate bridge. And then, um, you know, the potentially dealing with the um, constructed wetlands and all the outfalls that may end up 
bottom parking. What's the span on the bridge? Well, it was it was it wasn't extreme. In, in the master plan, we suggested a suspension bridge, but um, given that they're less they're, expensive, they're, thirty feet or sixty oh, no, feet. It's, or no, it's a couple hundred feet. A couple hundred feet. Yes, yeah. it's, it's across. And, and we've talked bridge. about possibly moving the bridge location depending on uh, cost and, and what the feasibility. So I recently was planning a, another bridge like that in the, in another project in Saratoga, and I worked with our structural engineer. They started with suspension. We had like 300 feet. And in the end, a pre-stressed concrete with a bit of a camber was what did it you know, better. And we did a nice design. We were able to give it a little bit of a curve. Um, so it ended up not being very expensive. So we'll evaluate, we'll check both. It has better, uh, less visual impact if it's just a, a pre-stressed concrete structure. Or a truss is the cheapest. Can, steel truss, steel truss, prefabricated or yeah. glue lamb are all good options and less expensive than a suspension bridge. So I let you, you know, Charlie go over the task. Well, there's a bit of parking. There's a bit of the amphitheater was here. It's, it's quite some slopes to deal with coming up in boardwalks and linking back again and the parking and, and, and the playground. So it's a large property. A lot of really poor stuff. We understand this is a lot of, uh, at the time, push from the community, just growing development. I'm not sure where that is now, but I'm sure the pressure for growth will continue. So preserving this much land is really a, a great asset. And and then there is always this issue with when people from the community can permeate the park and enter the park, and once they do, really what matters is how they connect to a box or a path system. How they, you know, if they come by bike, they need some way of dealing with the bicycles. Or if you don't want bikes, of having a gate so that they leave them outside. <coughs> so it's very general. I guess the, most of the idea of the master plan was to come up with a reasonable amount of what's a program, what it might cost, and then reaching consensus. You know, with the community, uh, we had many meetings here as to what was the vision for the park. We also talk about low LED, you know, lighting and all of that. I mean, really people were interested into the detail of sustainability as well as program fitness. So this is the time to start looking at in detail what this first phase is so that we can help you evaluate cost and how we can maximize your limited funds. <laughs> it's a small budget project, but I think we can, if we do it right, we can give you a lot for, uh, or the community a lot for What's invested in there? First, sure. remember the grant that we got is, built, is to build the entire park, correct? Not well, it's to build uh, what we've defined as phase two, and so phase one that we've already implemented did not quite correspond with the preferred alternative in the parks plan. Okay. We did less than what was called up for phase one, and so this takes us to like phase one point five uh, in the master plan, but so it's a completing, 700 and completing phase one and building phase two. Yeah, it's a $750,000, $780,000 grant. I don't remember the exact amount. Thank you. So we understand that per the RFQ and what we've outlined in our statement here, there are a number of elements that we'll take through design and construction documents. And just quickly, that's picnic shelter, trails, Entry plaza with a water feature, um, landscaping, maybe some native plant restoration, certain areas, um, culvert replacement, boardwalks, viewing platform, children's play area or playground, and pedestrian bridge. Mm -hmm. So those are the key things we're going to focus on for this part, using the master plan as some direction and guidance. And then again, as Mario mentioned, we'll work with the community to take these designs forward, make sure everything is represents what the community wants to see happen here. Right. And I would suggest through this process that we design all those elements to a complete ad ready set. As we get towards the end, we can take those elements that are the key components, for example, is the main bid, but we can have a bid alternate for 
let's say there's three or four things that we just don't know what's going to fit and we can do those as bid alternates or a separate schedule for two things one is it gives us a price for future budgeting and two we could potentially say okay we can do all these and we can pick up this additional one and then maybe the council says we'll find the money to do this additional one but we'll have that so we'll want to make sure that we've designed those completely and identify them and do some bid alts yeah sure yeah, I think we're going to have to do that because the budget is, is limited. And I think we want to identify that rather early, perhaps as we do schematic design. We have a budget and then confirm that at TD. So then you know from the very beginning what can be built for the anticipated construction money. And then you'll know whether to approve additional funds for another key element or start securing funds for that. And, and so the committee members know the, the list that was read there is, is roughly what is in the grant agreement in terms of what we are obligated to provide. They, the, they don't get into the specifics of how grandiose anything has to be and so we have, we have to deliver all of those items but they can be scaled to fit our budget and alternatively the city council could opt to if they decide that it's worth spending an extra Thirty or forty thousand dollars on any one item, you know there are park impact fee dollars that could be made available, and that would be a budget decision. So you have the option to make this bigger if you. Uh, if, if we determine that we're going to have to scale something down, uh, you may want to increase the city's match from the fifty percent requirement to fifty-five or sixty percent if that's needed. What do we have left in the uh, park impact fees that were contributed? It's about one hundred eighty-five on there. Yeah, I think we're, we're just under 200000 in the McCormick money, but then we also have city park impact fees, which are in a separate uh, budget line item. And uh, I, I think that essentially completes our required match, but we're going to continue collecting impact fees between now and 2017. And so potentially, uh, you know, we'll have another fifty or $60,000 that we, uh, you know, collect in that, that period. So we, Jones and Jones, will be the lead consultant, prime consultant, You're responsible for the overall design of all these components. Um, on our team, listed kind of under consultant background, we have an org chart, and we'll be assisted by Excel Tech Consultant. And so they're a full service um, engineering firm, doing civil engineering, structural engineering, environmental permitting and so some of these components even like for example even the picnic shelter and certainly the bridge are going to have a structural engineering aspect the culvert replacement civil engineering and then there are some permitting issues that we need to look at so we'll be working with Excel Tech on, on all these things um, then we identified um, NL Olson Associates our local engineering geotechnical engineering firm uh, to do geotechnical engineering and any additional surveying that might be needed. So we think we have a pretty uh, lean team. We can kind of cover all the bases with us and Excel Tech and NL Olson. Yeah, and, and Excel Tech Aside from the civil structural, um, environmental, um, also just from a uh, grant oversight perspective, I mean, they're performing the same on Route 10, same very similar services, making sure we don't trip up on the funding because uh, there's obviously strings attached to that, so you know, Buy America and you know, whatever. So. Well, Excel Tech will also help us with um, estimating. So as Mario mentioned, we want to kind of start early with looking at the costs and kind of make sure that we're, we can keep all this within budget. And they also provide construction administration uh, services, assistance bidding and negotiating, which we will also work with you on that. And we can work with you through construction. Uh, Excel Tech has folks who involved who are involved with construction quite a bit, and they can.
help take the project through uh, through construction. Yeah. So we have for for Johnson Johnson, if you know, is we Charlie and I will mostly do the project. I mean, charge of the project, but we have um, Dwayne Deeds, he's a playground specialist, he's a certified playground inspector, as well as a landscape architect and horticulturalist with native plants. So when it comes to looking at the playground, it's good to have to just look at it from a permitting point of view and make sure it's safe. And then Charlotte is our architect that if we need to go to the picnic shelter and we're not just purchasing one but designing something with character that fit or torture, she'll take that um, construction documents. I'll probably do the design and then she'll just detail that. And so that's why we have four on our staff, which you mostly would see, you know, Charlie and I when we move forward. Then with Excel Tech, John Atkins is their environmental permitting specialist. Look at wetland issues and what's required with wetland permitting. Um, Josh Rains, their civil engineer, Evan Grimm, their structural engineer, and Roger Horton works with folks on construction issues. And then, and then finally, Wes Johnson with NL Olson, software for geotechnical engineering. So the rest of our, um, most of the rest of our statement of qualification just kind of provides an overview of what we consider to be kind of related re recent projects. Um, some of these are local, some of them are elsewhere, other parts of the country, but we just finished a fairly large project in Gainesville, Florida called Payne's Prairie Sweetwater Park, and that involved the design of extensive boardwalk system, viewing platforms, overlook areas, as well as interpretation. Um, educational facilities, and uh, wetland restoration. And then uh, on Bainbridge Island, we completed this about, what, five or six years ago, the, the uh, Bainbridge Island Exclusion Memorial. Again, a lot of trails, paths, and boardwalks, and wetlands. Um, you know, what was unique to this project was kind of a, a story wall discussed the uh, removal of Japanese Americans during World War II. And then the Vancouver Land Bridge um, in Vancouver, Washington. That really is kind of a multimodal. I've been on that. Yeah, good. It's, I like it. It's holding up pretty well. <laughs> um, and then kind of going on, these are just a brief overviews of several other more recent um, projects in the area. Mercer Slough, Snoqualmie Point Park, Preston Mill. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Mountain to Sound Greenway Trust. Over the years, we did the original master plan for Mountain to Sound Greenway, and then we've done a lot of greenway projects over the years for, um, for the, the Mountain to Sound Greenway, including Snoqualmie Point Park, Preston Mill, um, Rattlesnake Lake. Those are all greenway projects. And Excel Tech provided a, an overview of some of their related work. They, they've done you know, a fair amount of work over here on the peninsula. And uh, I think they mentioned they had been doing some work, had done some work for Port Orchard um, past, as well as in the Bremerton area. So again, we think we have a pretty good Pretty well qualified team for this. And, uh, really look forward to working with you all on this. <clears throat> yeah. Then the project approach um, kind of just goes through kind of a, a step by step or, or things that we're going to look at addressing as we carry the project forward. Kind of revisiting some of the decisions that were made in the master plan, again working with the community, kind of go through what we plan to implement in this phase two, what the community's desires are, their values. Um, of course, we'll be in charge of 
project administration and, and project management. Um, worked with Excel Tech on the permitting and get that started early so that by the time construction documents are ready to go, the permits are in place. We don't have any snags there. Um, and again, cost control, working with Excel Tech's estimators from the very beginning to see what we're looking at in terms of the cost for these various project elements and maintaining things within the budget and bid support and construction services. So near the end here, we have kind of a preliminary work plan, which is kind of a step-by-step -step, um, incremental approach or process to what we see uh, doing in this project. And then the schedule, we feel that you know, what we need to do in terms of design, construction documents, permitting, and so forth, community involvement, it's all easily attainable within the, uh, the project schedule that was identified in the, uh, in the grant. Right. I guess the key thing for the council is to know that what's proposed in the 2016 budget is just the design and getting to ad ready bid documents and the actual construction will be a 2017 budgeted item, but we'll have all the information uh, at the end of 2016 to prepare the 2017 budget. And I think from a cost standpoint, you know, having that ready to bid in January or February for June or July construction probably is going to get us a better price than, uh, you know, trying to get them, trying to bid and put them to work immediately. I think the contractors like to have work lined up through the, yeah. the year, and I think this schedule just works uh, well for the city. Yeah. It's what we're doing on the DeKalb Pier. I'm just finishing up the DeKalb Pier phase two, add ready documents so that they're actually going to add January 5th or whatever so that we're actually getting a contract in February. So that it's that initial, not when the contractor's busy and trying to squeeze stuff in at a higher price. I would just say that I remember I sat on the committee when we were doing the master plan and I know I appreciated working with your group at that time. Good. Well, thanks. So yeah, we really look forward to seeing these projects through when we do the master plan and taking it through design and construction documents. I mean, you really have to take a long-term perspective on some of these on right. these projects. We've done several this way. Um, I had a question for you and that was uh, just your familiarity with the Recreation Conservation Office grant programs, and so obviously this is state money through the RCO. If you worked uh, with those projects, I, mean, I don't find that agency to be really difficult to work with, like some federal projects. But have you done this sort of thing? Yeah, on um, Ravens Ravensdale Park, some of that funding came through through that organization. Um, Most of the fields, there yeah. were a lot of sports fields in that, and there was a big forest adjacent to it. Then, yeah, in the past, uh, North SeaTac Park, I um, can't remember who, what some of the other parks were that received funding from that group. So, uh, yeah, but we're familiar work, working with them. So for clarification, Nick, I know that we went through a RFQ. We received only the one proposal. Uh, Jones & Jones is on our professional services roster along with the consultants, sub-consultants. Are we still, are you still looking to score these, or? Um, I just wanted to put documentation in that, you know, even though we only have one that everybody reviewed it and found them to be qualified or, or not right, qualified. So you still want these? Yes. <laughs> okay. yes. Yeah, that's more formality, but. Right. Um, did any of, uh, either of the council members have any questions? And who do you want, so you want the Public Properties Committee members and you and I, who do you want to score this? Uh, I would like the committee members and then the, yeah, you and I. So, okay, um, I don't know if there's any concluding remarks. I think we'll have some discussion on this and then uh, get in touch with you in the next week or so. And so okay. uh, ideally we'll have this under contract by the end of the year for a January 1 start date. Depending on agendas, it might be the first meeting in January, retroactive yeah. to January 1. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. Terrific. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over. Yes. So early.
wasn't bad. I came over on uh, the Fauntleroy, Fauntleroy. Southworth Ferry. I live in West Seattle, so okay. it wasn't. Oh, that's not too bad then. <coughs> They're down a boat today, though, right? They are. I, was, I heard, heard that just as I was going out the door, and I thought, uh-oh. They're wasted. They are. All right. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> keep that. Okay, right. great. Thank you. Thank you. placed at the uh, Welcome to Port Orchard sign on Tremont Street. And so I've provided a map and a um, image from Google Earth of the existing uh, Welcome to Port Orchard sign. They've also included the letter that we received. My first question, Nick, is who owns that sign? <coughs> My name is Arlene Burton, and I'm a member of Beta Zuma Phi. I have been for 52 years. And I think I'm the oldest member in Port Orchard, so we're an international uh, non-academic sorority, and we um, have six chapters in Port Orchard. And uh, they do a lot of cultural service and social things for the, for the surrounding area. And I, in 2000, I started contacting Port Orchard to see if we could put the signage up in uh, Fremont. And uh, I didn't get much response, so in 2004, I wrote another letter to Mr. Curls, and I did not get any response. Um, the next letter I wrote was in 2007, and they said they were going to be widening the street, and so they um, would put it on hold, you know. And um, so uh, in 2012, I um, contacted, I believe it was Carolyn Powers, and I didn't receive an answer. So now in 2015, I wrote another letter and I did receive an answer and that's why I'm here today. So thank you very much. I do have a couple of pictures. Our sign is a very nice sign. It's uh, uh, 24 by 36 metal, uh, serviceable to the weather and uh, uh, we're requesting is that yeah. you consider putting it up on the signage. So I guess that to answer your question, Rob, I think, could probably answer it better. My understanding is that, because there were some maintenance issues that I remember that came up with this, and I thought that <coughs> it was Rotary yeah, or Juana's that actually owns the poles and maintains it. and. But, so that's like, It's located in the public right of way, but correct. it is maintained by Kiwanis, I yeah, think. Is it Kiwanis or Rotary? Rotary. One, of, one of the activities, uh, organizations, but I think the approval process, I, I don't know what resolution, uh, maybe Brandy, you'd have to go back and look and see, maybe this thing had to have been permitted and allowed you know, a long time ago under some auspice of oversight and 
And I know that we do, for the signs that are in the right-of-way, uh, we have contracts. Um, I don't know if this is, there's, um, we were able to find a majority of the signs that were posted in the right-of-way uh, four or five years ago. We ended up finding contracts. And I don't know if this is one of them that we found, but I can go look in our records to see if there is a contract and if so, what does that contract outline? And then I can also go back and search the minutes or the resolution to, to see who's in charge of the content or. And I also want to be clear, is the request to have their, um, their sign on this sign or is the request to have a separate sign? I'm assuming it's on. I was, I was requested it be put on the, the sign. On the sign that's already at there. Tremont. Yeah. And you know, there's that big circle in the center that could be moved up and create more room for the lower level. Is there a big round sign in the middle? Mm -hmm. Of Ford Orchard? Yeah. yeah. This could be moved up, and then there would be more signage room down here. Well, but I, but I, we don't maintain I would or say design what I'm that. saying is yeah. I'm not sure that's that's our our, yeah. our, our approval right. or disapproval. I think it's whoever does the sign. The city doesn't own the sign. Well, they, you know, there. I guess there is some uh, difference of opinion because every time that I did talk to someone, they seemed to, you know, like the Rotary was at, in charge of it for a while. Right. And um, and I don't know if they still are because I never got that information back in the last letter. So, um, so if I could be, um, maybe if I could have a letter of saying who's in charge of it, and then I could talk to them. That sounds like what we need to yeah, do. Yeah, that's is what I'd ask Brandy do to do. Trail back because there's got to be. My understanding is this is not the city sign. They got a sign permit, and it's maintained and operated by some entity. But there should be some something about they're not being able to restrict. I mean, the decision making on who. Who goes on that sign shouldn't be up to whoever's maintaining it um, but i think finding that background is one key piece and then the other piece is just understanding that with the tremont project that will hopefully start in 2017 um, this gets relocated by that same entity um, so or goes away. Well, I was going to say the other question yeah. that I would have is with our new wayfinding system, um, you know, what's the the lifespan of this sign? Yeah, this is something outside of the the wayfinding system. But I think uh, the more appropriate question is, what is the sign code going to allow? Because currently, it only allows signs erected by the uh, government agency, it doesn't allow private signs in the right of way. And so this is a non-conforming sign at this point in time. And so, you know, the way that I would look at this is that if you're adding to the face of a non-conforming sign or making changes to a non-conforming sign, our code currently allows that. I think it will continue to allow that. But as the road gets widened, I don't know how we make an accommodation for a sign in the right of way without, um, you know, a lease or Right, and that's where I think we have to go back to the original authority for this thing in the beginning to understand that. I just, I know that there's a roundabout here, and and I can't remember if, I think there's still room for this to be moved uphill or out of the way, not be in the roundabout, um, but um, I think the construction plans speak to this but I think to, as far as getting an answer back I'll go back and see what the construction is plans show for this for now I think Brandy needs to find out so what what I'm hearing is we're going to review the history of the sign to find out um, who maintains it and what authority it has to be there and then Nick will um, check our the design work to see I'll, I'll check the design work for Tremont and see what's anticipated right and then get with Nick and we'll see what that construction will do based on the new neutral content. Right, and then we, and we need to do this sign code, right? So 
Arlene, you've given us a whole bunch of tasks that we have to do now. It's, it's not just, what you're finding, it's not just as easy as to move the, the circle up and put your sign underneath it. There's some other homework we're going to have to do, but we will get back with you. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I look at that sign every time I drive by it. That's right. But anyway, I, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for, uh, you two for getting up early and coming to the meeting. And then Mark, you want to talk about um, the public um, art? Yes. Um, so I recently met <coughs> The artist, and his name is escaping me. Karsten Voice. Karsten Voice. Yes. Um, and so he's uh, he's more than happy to install. He has the artwork. There's some question as to whether we had it or he had it. We confirmed that he does have it. Because we couldn't find it. No, I think we we were going to store it, and then he just decided to store it. So. Location on this map, location three would be a good location, or location one. Location three is in that landscaped area that we mm -hmm. created as part of segment five. Um, and then segment one is obviously at the point over at segment four. So either of those locations are fine. Um, and again, he, when I met with him, he would be mounting piece of artwork so um, I think all we're looking for right now is process to move ahead with do you want us to make a decision as to where it's put or do we want to take that it needs to, to be a, a recommendation to the full committee or yeah. or take it to the work study yeah I would take it to work study and let the whole council decide where they wanted <coughs> it um, because we did accept the artwork mm -hmm. and it was our intent to put it somewhere along that path. Um, yeah, so I, th I personally think that one is where one I would put it. Was where I'd put it, yeah. Yeah, one is where I would put it, although it's kind of a dead end now. Um, yeah, I think long term it's a good place. I think long term it's a good <coughs> place for We it, are so. putting, um, just so you know, we are adding outside of the contract, we're placing. A bench, a picnic table, oh, okay. and a garbage receptacle out there, so that so at that least it's a a, at least it's a destination for now. Yeah. So, Fred, do you have an opinion? I like number one also. Okay. <clears throat> um, is the fence there temporarily? No, it's well the fence that's a, between Bay Four uh -huh. between Bay Four that's permanent. Uh, there's an opening, a 10-foot opening that we need to put a bollard in so somebody doesn't try to drive through there. But people can walk from there to Bay Street, right, through the cars? Or... Yes, they can okay. walk. They can get out and walk down, okay. and that's our right-of-way, but right. we're looking at leasing it or selling it. So for now, it's still Maple Street waterway right-of-way, but it's not a thoroughfare um, like at a, on the, at a Turner Park side. It's still going to be they're going to be walking through a car lot. We do, but we they're do. able physically able to do it. They're not blocked by that fence. That's no. no there's there's an opening now. If they okay. go all the way to the point, we fenced it off at the end temporarily. I mean, it's permanent okay. temporary fence. If that okay. makes sense. Okay. Instead of putting a rental fence up there, we just put a few more posts and just finished it um, okay. until we build segment three. And there is some effort in pushing. Uh, Segment three, I talked to, or we had a conversation during the ribbon cutting with uh, Brianna and some of the legislators, oh, okay. um, with Jesse and uh, uh, Jan, to see if we can move, move 500,000 of the 3.5 out of sooner. I would, I would check with Fred, but um, I'm hearing that we would take this to the full council work study with the recommendation of number one. Okay. Yes, I agree.
And maybe can I see? Yeah. Make sure the oh, staff report mentions yeah, liability. Um, some council members are concerned about liability um, for people harming themselves on the artwork. Oh. So just, you know, just be prepared for that question if it comes up. <clears throat> they were concerned about people harming themselves on the shark. Oh, that it was shark. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So just make sure that. Okay. And Deb will invite you up if you want to. Uh, You're the next agenda item. dangerous or derelict building code and we all received the um, email from <coughs> Carol and the information from uh, the paper from the man from Spokane Valley and then we also received um, in our packet, a summary from Doug. And so if Doug would express his summary for everyone. And his summary basically talks about our current situation and the deficiencies in it and what we might need moving forward. Um, so as, as I expressed uh, previously, this kind of arose because uh, we had a situation that seemed urgent to deal with with a dangerous building and based on my prior training uh, was that the uniform code for the abatement of dangerous buildings which we have in place here currently uh, was no longer viable under Washington state law. Uh, that kind of started off this whole process and, and as, as with consulting with Carol and, and reviewing this uh, got a little better understanding on that, that that's not exactly true. What really a big part of what this comes back to is a policy question. And that is, is the city ever going to actually go on property, on private property, and abate a dangerous building? Uh, because in doing so, you expend fairly considerable amounts of money and you want to be able to recover that money under the Uniform Code for the Abatement of Dangerous Buildings process or any other general nuisance process, you're able to file a lien against the property, a judgment from Superior Court, file that lien against the property. And essentially that lien has no priority. It's like a mechanics lien or, or something like that. It only has priority over other liens that are filed afterwards. So you have no priority over mortgages or any other um, higher priority lien. The state has created, has provided a code or a, a process that can be followed that under which you can file a lien that has, a prior, has priority over all other liens it's equal with property taxes. It's collected by the county with the property taxes and remitted back to the city. My understanding, and, and there's a little, I'm getting some different uh, interpretations from different attorneys, but essentially that's the process that was discussed in the, in the paper from Spokane, that if you want to do that, you, that's when you do have to adopt that process under RCW 3580 and follow that process. It's a much more cumbersome process. Uh, it, you're supposed to try to sell the materials, which really is most dangerous buildings. There's nothing sellable. Uh, but if you want to be able to recover your costs, then you need to go under that RCW 3580 process if you want to be able to have that lien priority. 
I know that that the idea of going of the city actually entering private property to do a dangerous building abatement is uh, a very sensitive issue. It's it's an extreme uh, use of government power. It's one of the highest uh, exercises of government power. Um, but my position, based on my experience, is it is absolutely a last resort. You avoid that at all costs. You do everything you can to not end up doing that. But there comes a time when you have no other alternative. Uh, and I, I can cite a number of examples. This is basically was a large part of what I did in my uh, prior jurisdiction. Uh, the person who was in federal prison for 20 years, uh, taking them to superior court and threatening to throw them in jail for contempt of court uh, if they don't abate their building, uh, really isn't going to get it, get you anywhere. Uh, the person who was a permanent, who owned property and was a permanent resident of Western State Hospital, didn't really get us anywhere. Uh, the person who committed suicide and burned the house as part of their suicide and had no heirs, no will, no nothing, there's no one really to go after. And some of those situations are highly dangerous. And, uh, and in my, my opinion, at some point, there's no alternative. Uh, you either have a situation that's dangerous to the public or you go in and, and you do what needs to be done. When I, when I reviewed these things, it seemed to me um, Carol was not supportive of 3580, which, which you had referred to. Um, and her, what I gleaned from what Carol had, had written was her concern um, is putting this through the court and taking it out of the hands of the city. Um, and and again, part of it is to recover costs and liability and all of those things. Some questions that come to my mind immediately um, is how many dangerous buildings do we have? Because when I think of a dangerous building, I think of perhaps the property that, um, that we had purchased that we took down this last year. So where we may have people living in there or drug dealings happening in there you know, and some things like that. Do we have a number of them? And I guess the impetus of my question is basically is how urgent is it for us to move forward with this? I would have two, uh, just to, to go to the last part of your question, how urgent it is. On the one hand, it is urgent. You never know a building tomorrow could become dangerous and we need the process. On the other hand, we need to do it right. And, and I certainly don't want to come to the council and say, here's a good process, let's adopt this, and then six months later come back to the council and say, you know what, uh, that wasn't so good, can we change that? Uh, so, so I really would like to make sure we, we take the time to, um, to do it right. Uh, as far as how many, I don't have an exact number. I do have uh, some examples, if, if you care to look at them, just of some of the ones that, that I know of particularly. And some of these are, are being dealt with. There's Most people, I think, know about the uh, kind of a roundhouse there at, uh, I think it's Melcher and Sherman. Uh, that property is, is hopefully going to be redeveloped soon. And so there's an owner that who can take care of that. But that's a good example. Um, one down on Bay Street that's that you would really notice that's half torn apart. And that one, uh, that would be a dangerous building if the owner weren't, weren't taking currently care taking care of it. And I do have him, he's got it, is a perimeter one? fencing, and he's working on demolishing it by hand. Is the one on Morton on your list too? Morton, I think there's something on Morton that uh, it's not connecting exactly as to which one that would be. 1000 block. Yeah, it's like 1013 Something Morton, I think. 1024. 1024. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember exactly what, I can't picture that one right off the top of my head, but I, that address does connect with me. Um, 
So the one there that's labeled Canyon is probably one of the best examples of one. Well, that one and, and, the, uh, okay. and the 202 Bay Street are, well, uh, let me back up. The one on Canyon is probably one of the best examples of one where we may need to actually go there. Uh, Kathy has tried for years to chase down the owner of that property. It's sitting vacant. It gets broken into by, uh, by vagrants. Um, this last, and one, one thing that happens a lot of times with these buildings, vagrants get in there and they end up setting fire to it. This last summer, as dry as it was, that house is a little ways away from other houses, but it's just in dense trees and all. That could have been a fire that could have spread to other houses. Something could happen, someone could get hurt in there. And she tried for years chasing down the owner. They're out of state, they move around, they don't respond. That's one that I, I expect we probably will have, will never be able to get done through any other process. Uh, the one on Bay Street there, that, yeah, that one is, is now bank owned, so we may be able to get the bank to deal with it. The big issue there is the entire slope is failing. And so it's essentially a, an unsellable house. So the bank is going to be stuck with it. But that's what I was wondering if many of these homes are bank owned. Some of them are. And, and getting back to the lien issue, um, one of the things I found uh, with the ones I've done is that a lot of times the liens, once they're filed, especially if they're filed against with the property taxes, once those properties go into foreclosure, the banks step up and pay off those liens because they need to do that to protect their lien, right. to protect their investment. And so a lot of those, that money doesn't sit out there forever. It, it gets uh, returned. Um, but in that case, we do have an owner. So that one, one way or another, I'll be able to get somebody to do, deal with that. Nick, in the, um, in the response we got from Carol, she indicates that she would, is going to provide us a draft proposed ordinance. Do you know if she's still doing that? Yes, yeah, she has provided that to us. Okay. And, and Doug and Carol have been working on this. But we thought we needed to have a higher level discussion than yeah. uh, considering that specific document at this time. And also because of uh, her having submitted her resignation effective at the end of the year, um, you know, council may want to wait and see. Th that was my question. That was one of my questions for the urgency of it. Is this something that we need to take care of within the next <clears throat> month or two? Or is this something that um, we can have the new council prioritize? And well, and, and I absolutely uh, want to to have some legal help yet in work in coming up with a draft. We definitely need uh, need to do it right, and and so uh, I think that does definitely put us on a longer timeline because yeah. we need we need the new attorney on board, and uh, we need time to work it out because there's a number of different ways we could go Can with this, okay. right? And what she has proposed is under Alternative C, which is going through the nuisance code. Um, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. And to to go back to the part of your question, I didn't uh, I didn't address, and that was that that Carol's concern with thirty five eighty had to do with going through court, and the uh, the thirty five eighty the RCW thirty five eighty in that process it doesn't specifically say that you go through court uh, to do an abatement, but I'm in complete agreement with Carol that that we don't do what's called summary abatement or administrative, which is where you just, if nobody appeals, you just go do it. Well, that's what um, I thought I read in 3580. I thought, my it, goodness, am I going to have to make this decision? I, yeah. I don't want to do it, 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 it kind of leaves, like a lot of these codes, it kind of leaves that part blank. It tells you, go ahead and do it, it but it doesn't tell you how to do it. And so absolutely, when I wrote a code for the city of Lakewood under that 3580 process, you know, they're going to Superior Court. So they're following that code, but they're not doing administrative or, or summary abatements. They are going to Superior Court. So there's nothing in that code that explicitly says you have to go through court, but there's nothing in there that precludes it either. So it's just a matter of how we write our, if we go under that process, how do we write our local uh, ordinance to make sure that, that yes, we do. The one 
exception to that, and, and this definitely needs legal review, and that is for emergency actions, for li true emergency actions. Um, you know, there's different opinions on that as far as whether you should or can do those as a summary, or whether the only level of emergency stuff you can do is maybe is outside of the property, fence it off, and things like that. Um, so <coughs> what I'm hearing are, is that this is an issue we want to take forward. It's important. It needs, it needs attention. But that we will do that. Um, Next year. Right. Yeah. We'll you know, put that on a priority list for the new council. And given Doug's background on this and his experience in developing this sort of thing previously, I want to have him working directly with uh, whatever future attorney we hire to, to develop this sort of thing. Okay. Just, I don't see the pictures in the house on Morton. That's <laughs> <laughs> the same question. 224. We were just <laughs> talking about that. Yeah. I looked in the windows and you want to step back when you. <clears throat> and what. Can you remind me of what the issue is with that house? It's, oh, it's been abandoned. It's falling down upon it. It was, um, I believe, improvements made without permits. The, um, oh, 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 the, now the, I, the, yes. The, there was um, basically a structure built on top of a slab, and the house is rotten, is rotten out from underneath. I mean, the walls, I mean, sway if you touch them. Okay, I, I need to take another look at that. I think that I, I know that's in in my list. Bad. Um, so, well, I mean, these are horrible. These are, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It seemed to me the issue that that why I hadn't uh, really done anything with that was in priority over some of these others is that it is secure. It's closed up. Nobody's getting in it. So you get in it pretty easy, I think. I have to take another look at that. And, and uh, just heads up, the neighbor who built the house next door is the guy that. Uh, made those improvements so that it's a foreclosure. I'm not sure There's if it's been sold. Yeah, it hasn't, um, I'm not sure if it's still bank owned. Okay, I'll have to look further, I'll have to look into that one more and see what, what I can do in the interim. If you heard the summary is we're going to, um, we feel this is important, it's not an emergency that we have to take care of immediately and we're gonna have the new council um, and the new attorney Okay. Prioritize that. Okay. And we're next. We're down to uh, the residential park making system. Can I ask Rob a very quick question? Okay. This yeah. sign. Yes. I, I have some thoughts. Of, does Rotary yes. manage that? Yes. <coughs> it's actually owned by or was built by the Morning Rotary Club. I know when I'm in the new Rotary Club, and I know when we put our attachment on it, we got permission from the Morning Rotary Club. To to to, make, add. to add to it. Okay. So, uh, whoever, if we're going to make any modifications or any uh, additions to it, you need to vet it through the Morning Rotary Club <coughs> at a contact point. Mm -hmm. Who the current president is right now, I could find out for you. Okay, well, I think we recommend that they consider including that. I mean, that's all that we would do. Yeah, right. But we wouldn't do it ourselves. Yeah. Right, right. I didn't think it was in the computer. So, somebody wanting. Right. Yeah, yeah she wants to add another sign to it. Yeah, and we weren't sure the history of it. We knew yeah. we didn't own it, and so we, we have tasks. Yeah, okay. morning, morning morning club. <clears throat> but there's some issues at some point of this being a non-conforming sign that will be dealt with at some point. Not well, necessarily by adding. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's how we're going to address that is probably something in the first roundabout, I would hope. I mean, this is... You go in the roundabout. Well, there's already a welcome to Port Orchard sign proposed for the first round of that. As far as our way Yeah. Um, and maybe it's a community service project where all of these clubs is something more grandiose and everybody pitches in and pays for it. Yeah, Silverdale, coming into Silverdale, they've got something. Mm -hmm. It yeah, has whaling new, days new, and all that kind of stuff on it. The new Supreme Court case is really going to make this complicated, so okay. um, we'll have to. Right. Right, and the, sign, the whole sign ordinance came up with that. So. Okay. Um, the easiest thing for our lane now is to work with the morning road over there. Right. They, 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 work, we they were very receptive as to us putting it on there. They just had you know, one. So we should nice. refer her to them. Yeah, well, we had a couple other tasks Brandy was going And so now we're down to the residential partner permit system. 
Brandy, and I just want to say right up front that I appreciate you took out all of the community event parking permit. And I did talk to the chief to ask him, you know, what his thoughts were on that. And um, he said that it just doesn't make sense. He goes, he's not quite sure why, it, why it's in there. He says that there isn't any problems regarding community events. And he said that we probably shouldn't put it in there because then you're going to have to define what is a community event. And he goes, it's easy to remove that. Um, and then should there be a community event that comes up, then we can relook at the code to see how we can best fit that. Um, so that's the reason why like we struck of July that when we close Perry off. No, the way this was read, the way it had been in here, is if it's a school event or a church meeting or anything, they had to get parking permits. So we took that all out. We were having trouble figuring it out. And most of most of the events that he said anyways would happen during the evening or during the week um, weekends, which you don't need a permit for that because it's, you know, the, the uh, limitations um, are not within that scope. So, um, and then I just, residential area means, I did go back and look and we have another section of our code um, 10.12560 that actually describes what residential area means and so I just took out that um, information and put in where they can go and see which area it applies to um, what else I did go back and do <clears throat> a little bit more of a cost analysis to not only include our staff but also the finance staff to process the permit so previously I was recommending six and three dollars with financing processing the permit, I just brought it up to ten dollars and five dollars. So I don't know. If Historically, we've just given them out. Correct. So we're talking about there being a, are they going to be better quality? Uh, well, the ones we yes had, I have on currently in my car is so, probably an, an unreadable within. Yeah, I have its life. Um, Janine and the um, res, res, uh, the uh, parking enforcement officers have been working together to develop a new permit. And it's my understanding that they're also going to um, change out the type to where it can go on the window, um, being seen from the window on the inside, because a lot of comments that we get is people get new cars, they don't want it on their bumpers. Um, so they've worked with, um, Janine and um, Melinda have worked together to go and get samples from permitting. The stickers we had the last time lasted much longer than the, the green ones the yes green ones we have right now yes. they just completely faded out and that's why we went uh that's why you Who don't the other cost over uh <laughs> quality so we learned that <laughs> yes and we've uh, factored that cost in with our new permit so we make sure that it is better quality and it's not bright yellow okay. um fred i don't know or rob if you've had a chance to look at this but I think it's ready probably to go to full council whenever we can get it on a work study. I have it slated for um, November's work study session um, in hopes that I can get um, any recommendations from so that. And get it for January. First. Because we do need to order those tags. Does it need to go to a work study? I mean, it's just. That's just if or know. just take it straight to, to council. council. Yeah. We I mean, if there's that. enough changes that you think that's controversial that maybe. I think the only question is the $10 for the fee, the fee, but I mean, we can address that at the council. Okay. The fee, and if I'm they can do it remotely, do they have to come here in person to get it, or can they? They can go online, write a check. I mean, we're pretty. And they can provide the information. Like you're not asking for their registration. You're asking for. We have to show. They have to show proof that they own the vehicle. So, you know, if, if they can scan and email it to us or that type of thing. But we do have some. We need some sort of proof that they actually own the vehicle. And I know. And that they reside in that home. One of the okay. notes that I made as when when we indicated everything that we asked them for, we don't ask them for any insurance. No, we don't. Okay, we don't care. We Not for all have insurance. Yeah. Well, it's part. The only thing the state's concerned about is liability. You know, if it's not driving, we have <laughs> <laughs> We've never asked that. We haven't asked that question um, previously. I, back to my question about what, I think just the work studies have gotten so much on them. Would it be easy, is it, are we going to have more time to, Honestly, the next two agendas, that whether it's the work study session or the business ones, they're so full because you got the end of the year yeah. stuff. Is but this something that can wait until January? <coughs> or she would we, like to get it going. You need it implemented. Yeah, I need it. Is this the current the ones expire at the end of this year? I'm sorry? Do the current ones expire at the yes. end of this year? Yes. And we still have to order tags, and we have people, we have, I think, 15 left. 
Okay. So rather than order more of the old and want to get the new ones. Then I would say let's don't take it to work study. Because yeah. yeah. again, I think let's the only the council. Yeah. real question is going to be the. the and I'll make sure I um, uh, provide some extra information in the staff report. So okay. the last meeting in November. November yeah. 24th, do you want to do a consent? No. no. <laughs> it's a business <laughs> item. <laughs> but nice try. Yeah. Um, and then I think that to... was. Yeah, I know. I know you are. No, the ten dollar fee is going to be inconvenient. And then one other note from last time to this time is I just went back and looked at other sections of the code and com um, added commercial vehicle bus to those. I noticed that you had you had added some. Yeah. yeah. Or living out of their vehicle. They want to get one, right? Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, yeah okay. to show that they're living at the home. An address, yeah. Okay, then we're going to go down to basically items. Um, six through nine? Yeah, six through nine were just kind of follow up from things that we had okay, in well, test before. Well, the treasurer just said I've got to meet at 10 okay. with the auditor that wasn't scheduled. Wasn't left. So I could do all three of these in two minutes. Yeah, my, my question on is 640 Bay Street. Wasn't the temporary stuff? We the, know. The 640 Bay, the, the temporary fencing is now in our right. name. Uh, the auth what I heard from council was we were going to go ahead and start working on that temporary right. improvement, which was the, the gravel, the permanent fence on Frederick. Um, and that's still underway. It's just that we ended up having to do that additional work with segment four and the Arnold parking. So, right. Right. so we're, it's in process. Right. But um, as far as 2016 parks. Budget. Just a second. I want to go back to Six Footage Bay Street. And my my concern wasn't the short term. It was also some of the long term stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, didn't we have an issue with density, and did we fix that? No. The Planning Commission made their recommendation on that particular ordinance, but I was hoping to include that revision with other code updates that we had been working on because it was going to require bringing a separate ordinance through the process. Um, we can still bring that forward independently, but it was my hope to also bring other zoning code updates forward at that time. Could it be done in January at least? It could be, yeah. yeah my, my only concern is, I guess where, I know we have the, the short term stuff done and have great confidence you're going to make that happen, Mark. Right. But if, if what I have heard from Council is that they're interested in marketing that property. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, are there any underlying issues that we need to clear up yeah. before we market it? And I, in, density was in the back of my mind. I didn't know if there was anything else. So, so I, I guess the question then, the Planning Commission's recommendation, which Council doesn't have to take, uh, I believe was 30 was changing that from 12 to 30 units per acre uh, the height wouldn't change at all it was just purely density numbers um, my initial recommendation had been 48 units Correct. per acre and so if this committee has an, a recommendation on what they'd like to see go forward to council um, now would be the time I guess to give me that direction and I don't know that we have an opinion right now I was just yeah. I remember bring a blank it, forward and you can make a motion to insert yeah I just knew it was out there and we have a commitment mm -hmm. to the citizens to look at 640 every meeting and keep it moving forward. And density was the first thing that came to my mind. I would be in favor of increasing the density. The number, I'm not sure if it's 30 or, or whatever. I guess give us some hypothetical when it comes forward in Jan yeah. January that um, the 30 means, you know. You want me to use 640 as an example? Use 640 example. It's so many dwelling units mm -hmm. uh, up to because. Yeah. Uh, and if it's this, then it's this many dwelling units of. Well, we also size. we also have in the DOD have that 600 square foot <clears throat> minimum. Minimum, but when we do this, it's going to go into the mixed use code, and so it'll be wherever we have mixed use. Mm -hmm. So okay. anyway, that was my main on that one, and then okay, now Mark, we'll put you back on track. Okay, on the budget for parks, uh, other than the McCormick design, there's nothing currently in the. 2016 budget. Um, I, I noticed in the supplemental you had um, there was uh, some money put in to redo the tennis courts and the basketball courts. And and Central Park irrigation. Yeah, I have a number of supplemental items. Nothing's in the current, current. budget. Okay. Yes. Um, and then Arnold and Bay, that's done. Um, 
received a very nice email from Josephine Samantha Smith saying how wonderful it is, and thanking the city. And then going back to the Paul Powers Park, we had, um, didn't we have, we have Norm Olson do some work for us? And so do we have those plans ready? They're just on the shelf waiting for? Right. We did the, we did the interim uh, design, which was basically uh, just leveling the field and putting in some fencing. It really wasn't anything more than that. Right. But like it's seated. Yeah, but we had, it had gone from uh, doing that plan and then that got put on hold because then there's this idea that it was going to be much larger, a active, passive thing. We did the survey, um, so we identified our boundary, and then it went back to just doing the interim, but then there was no, uh, that was when Councilman Cartwright at the time brought up the issue of why are we putting any money into Did Paul Powers Park at all? That led to the conversation of the Parks Commission that before we start looking at doing any of these undeveloped parks, and I, I, there's like two or three in the city that I can think of. What, Lundberg? And Lundberg, Bethel, um, you know, right. there needed to be, do we, want, yeah, do we want Paul Powers to be a park or do we want it to be a public works facility? I mean, so that's why we've, all we have is the design, but it's it kind of the brakes were hit when it was. Right. Do we even want to make Paul Powers Park a park? And the reason that I brought up some of these things on both this agenda and economic development is we don't know who's going to be in these committees. We get new committees in the in, in January, and I want a record of <coughs> the status of what we've worked on and where it is, so that we can bring committee members up to speed fairly quickly. And I know when I had, I couldn't remember why we had stopped on Paul Powers, but it, I, you've refreshed my yes. memory. Is, and it, I is it big enough now for a group of kids to play soccer on? We were, that, that larger design element actually had a full-size football soccer field on the upper, and then there was enough to have kind of a, so that's an active area, and then there was a passive trails and picnic tables and stuff. But again, I think that concept uh, alarmed Councilman Cartwright on is that really the best place to have those sorts of activities, more of the, the passive. Um, so it just so it, it got on hold, and then a lot of other things okay. came up. So that's where it is. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. And I, I think since then, too, the fact that the high school now has an artificial surface that can be used more frequently than the grass field could be used, and probably factors into, into that. is that even needed uh, or is the school facility now available for these other organizations yeah. right. it seems like that's it's still other than dealing with the parking issue you know the peewees having a permanent homes but they they're just not interested in moving last time we talked so yeah the, again that's a a park discussion that um, right. needs to be. okay then we'll go on and i think that was all for you that you spent your name well, I had a question for okay. Nick. So on the DeCamp facility conversation, do you yeah. need me here for that? or No, I think we can handle that discussion. Okay. One quick we bug up, too. This is, um, by the way, I went uh, this weekend and looked at the bridge. It's awesome. Yeah. There it is. I did notice, because we were there in the rain, it's a bit of a bird bath right in the middle of mid-span in the bridge. So I don't know if you've signed off on. No, we're still. <laughs> right side crossing over and it's you know it's three quarters of an inch deep so yeah yeah definitely from a snow and ice perspective we have to be on top of that okay that we're, nice we, job yeah really nice job we were there at low tide you know over at the point looking back at the, at the beach and, and I think it was better at high tide Really? <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to low tide off in the back of high tide. So nice job. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be jumping off at uh, <laughs> the sun. Oh, on, on the this, New Year's. Are no, we going to have a New Year's jump off the bridge? Course. It's not yeah. deep enough, is it? No, it's <laughs> high tide it is. I think fishing. I think we're actually at yeah, Future Public Properties again is going to be the bridge. I think we have to fishing off the bridge. Um, yeah. and, Jumping off the bridge, we'll have to address that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh,
street vacation street ordinance. Vacation ordinance. Yeah, so this um, ordinance, we have received a petition to vacate the portion of uh, Dwight? Dwight that Fred had brought to the committee's attention. Um, again, that is one of the right-of-ways that we've determined to be subject to the non-user statute the, of 1889-90. Um, and we have a lot of right-of-ways that are unopened in the city that go back uh, pre-incorporation of the city that were that were established in the county and are, which are vacated as a matter of law. Our current code doesn't allow us uh, a special procedure to vacate those because you wouldn't have to actually buy those from the city. They are vacated. It's just a matter of getting that recognized by the uh, county auditor. So, um, and I think, Brandy, you've had some involvement in this as well, but this ordinance, I, I feel, is ready for adoption and we are on hold on processing this vacation request that we have until this is adopted. Um, I think the big difference between where we're at now is I think currently we've adopted a per square foot fee, which is not, uh, I don't think is the proper way to be doing vacates. I think you're required to have an appraisal uh, in order to consider a street vacation. And so this ordinance, among other things, updates uh, the process and the requirements for uh, an appraisal. Um, you don't need to have a full-blown appraisal having somebody come in and analyze and provide a uh, appraisal we just have to make sure that we get fair market value so if if somebody well, contacts property analysis but a broker could be correct yeah, they can contact a real estate agent and say hey this this type of property would go for x amount of dollars and that is from what i understand from legal counsel that that is sufficient so we don't need an mii correct. appraisal yeah. The, yeah. the property valuation is probably a, a more so a property valuation provided by a real estate professional yes would be a, a way to yeah word that yes so yeah at least i think it's staff's recommendation that we yeah I adopt don't, this i don't know that i'm real warm and fuzzy about that about about it just being a real estate you see for somebody to have to go spend three to five hundred dollars on an appraisal to buy no, no. Seven hundred dollars of land, and it would come to the, right. the council would, would make that decision. What? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It would come to the council to make that decision of what the documents that they provided would be included in the council to make that decision of whether they wanted to vacate that right away for the amount of funds that they received. So, yeah, if you guys but felt I, one I, more I would rather have a more defined process. I hate for somebody to go spend one hundred and fifty bucks right. on evaluation, and then it comes all the way to us. And then we say, no, we want more. Right. We want more than that. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, I, think I think it to me. I think it depends on the value of the property. The property, exactly. <laughs> right. I think. Um, right. And I'll look at that section of the code and make sure that it's clear as to what exactly they need to do. Whether it's just seeking, you know, real estate appraisal and what that. Um, what that's defined as you know you can't just call somebody on the phone and say blah blah there's got to be a process yeah i think typically these i mean this is typically a residential street vacation it's yeah. generally not commercial mm -hmm. residential appraisers are you know it's it's not that expensive i've typically been able to do this for 300 dollars a pop on a vacation which i don't think is unreasonable for you know. I, I think it's important that the city document well and, and the other thing is um and the other thing is, and to get specific, is the property in question that we're being asked to vacate. Um, you have two property owners there, and so they're going to have to come to a mutual agreement too. And you know, and they may have different interests in the property. So, with this petition, the city doesn't get anything. We don't get any money because we say it belongs to them in the first place? Or well, well there, there's two processes in here. There's a standard street vacation, and then there's a vacation under this old 1889 law. Um, under a standard vacation, we do get compensation. But my understanding is that that we we get the appraisal, but we don't have to sell it for the full appraised value, but we have to have the appraisal on file to make Correct. that determination. And you're allowed to sell it for less. And so if you want to offset the price of the property for... Uh, taking into account an appraisal price, you can do that. We haven't done that, though. Correct. We've never done that. We've charged them whatever they they're... Yeah. Yeah. We wouldn't do that, I don't think. But 
No, I was just concerned because then we were hearing that because it was splatted for 1889, they don't have to pay us anything. So I may be misunderstanding uh, the new process. I'll confirm that because no, I think no. this process, that process that's being, yes, that's my understanding too. And what they have to do is they have to follow through the vacation process to get it on the tax roll so that it's, you know, so they're paying their taxes for it. And I think that's the difference between pre plat and after plat from that 1800 is whether the city can actually receive compensation from it actually being the city's right away or is it not the city's right away but we'll we'll get that figured out yeah and that's in 12.08.060 which was just added to this the original draft that we had discussed with carol and it clearly says that an appraisal is not required in those instances i just said that this in my industry anyway there's an appraisal and then there's what's called valuation we used to use what was called even those price opinions and then it just shoot from the hip. I mean, if we were at three thousand dollars or five thousand dollars or under, I'd be more, I'd be comfortable with a broker's right. price opinion or right. some sort of an evaluation. We get up into north of five thousand um, dollars. I think we probably ought to have an appraisal done. So the five thousand be a threshold potentially. Or and yeah. then I'm just shooting from the hip. Right. I, right. You know, but I, I, again, because you know this image. Immediate pushback I did when you said, you know, just uh, a real estate evaluation, and I'm that going. doesn't seem unbiased. It, it, that was that was kind of my point, and, and they don't have to meet the same. Um, they don't criteria that um, you know that an appraiser is going to have to. In, in reading the definition here, or the the appraisal that says that the director is authorized to obtain appraisals from qualified independent appraisers the fair market value of such streets, alleys, or public places. And so it doesn't define what an independent, an independent appraiser is or what constitutes qualified. And so I think it would be up to the judgment of the public works director to. Correct. I think you're putting them in an awkward place. Yeah, so I mean, we can specify, but um, I guess if, uh, I would want to hear that. I would want that suggestion from the committee um, or, or I can go ask the attorney to more clearly define that, whichever you prefer. I guess the first question is, is something other than a, a, an appraisal by a certified appraiser acceptable? Yeah, I guess to me, it, again, it goes to, um, I don't know. You've got this right away, and typically you're going to have property owners on each side of it, um, and they're each going to have to pay their half. So um, maybe three hundred dollars isn't isn't onerous. Yeah, I, I I see. I'm leaning for an appraisal, and I think you know if the appraiser isn't going out and taking pictures and doing a bunch of other stuff, you know they can probably get something at a reasonable. <clears throat> so based on what you've just said I would suggest just adding a little bit of language here to say that this needs to be a certain better type of appraisal yeah. better define what an appraisal is mm -hmm. okay and then if we do that bring it forward to council bring it back to the committee Yeah, I think it should be able to go to council. Yeah. I think we need to take that to a work study. It's pretty general. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. We will schedule it for maybe uh, early December. Would you, you like to have a public hearing on this or just bring it forward for consideration? It's not required for public hearing, but. I don't think that we would do it all the same night. Yeah, yeah. Same night. yeah. And I don't know this. If our agendas are so full through the end of the year, yeah. Yeah. I think this could wait till January. Could wait. Okay. I mean, it's, it's just depressing. Well, delaying the pending vacation. Right. We just have a pending vacation. Oh, we do. I didn't right. yeah. yes. realize that. Yeah. yeah. Do we, <coughs> if we don't act on this, though, there, we have enough criteria for that to be processed. Or is that way? No, we don't. No, it's right. recommended we put a process in place first and then we process the, okay. the application. So either we can reach out to them to see, hey, you know. Do you mind waiting until January? Or, right. Yeah. Or is there a time frame now? when mm -hmm. they submit a 
Mm -hmm. I'll have to look and see because once we submit it, we, I think we have 60 days. I'll have to look and see. I would definitely (coughs) reach out to them because I know both parties are actively um, interested in this vacation. So they're working on it. And I believe we received three vacations from both parcels. Yeah, they both, they're both, both of them submitted. Both owners. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So there were three that we've heard from two of the three or just the two on Sydney? Both sides of the street. Okay. Yeah. And not the okay. other side of the canyon. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Um, okay. And then we will go down to the McCormick Woods Village. Part selection of contract again. Oh, yeah, and so there was a score sheet that was put in the packet. I'm just hoping that you guys will evaluate the presentation. Do you have to sign no, just write your name at the top. I just want to put it in the <laughs> file folder documenting uh, that we did. You know, the evaluate. other thing I'd like to request is when you bring this before council, if your um, report can just give a very general idea of how much is funded and just so the public understands that next year they won't see anything, but this is what we're doing, um, the design portion. And then how much of construction we have um, funds available for. So schedule and funding. Yeah, just something very brief, so. This back then. Yes, please, thank you. And so the recommendation then would be to enter into negotiations with Jones and Jones at this time and uh, check their uh, references. And well, and if, if the only stumbling block I would see is there, since they know they're the sole source at this point, the fee comes in at mm-hmm. way more than we're comfortable with, then we'd have to reevaluate. Yeah. yeah. And I would also, uh, as I talked to you earlier, give James Weaver a call because he worked with them when we did that. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's you good. know, the, the plan. And <clears throat> I remember it being Easy. Very, very good. Yeah, good, I do too. I had, I had nothing but yeah. good feelings with the Me company. So. Okay. <clears throat> All right. the, um, the regional decamped facility uh, retrofit. We've run into a problem. Public Works has submitted their permit applications to our department, and we have found that the, the site actually straddles a zoning boundary uh, between community facilities and industrial. In our industrial zone, we don't allow for sewage treatment facilities. So the simple fix, because changing zoning would require a comprehensive plan amendment or, uh, and then then actually changing the zoning map, the simple fix is to change the zoning table to include sewer treatment facility in the the table. And so actually this potentially could be, I I guess this still would have to go to the planning commission. So the recommendation would need to be send this proposal to the planning commission, evaluate it, and then bring back an ordinance so that this can be approved and so that when this is built, the use conforms to the, the zoning. Um, and given that we don't have private sewer treatment facility operators, I don't think it's a problem to allow it in an, in an, in an industrial zone. So would we do it um, just as permitted or would we do it with a conditional use permit? We could even do it as permitted and have a footnote that um, on publicly owned land or city owned land, um, if we're concerned, we could have to do it. Yeah, or, or make it, yeah, I think that would be Something along those lines that it's outright permitted on land that we're putting a regional facility on. Okay, that's a good idea. Okay. So, um, yeah, we'll send that to the Planning Commission uh, at the mm-hmm. committee's recommendation and uh, probably bring it back to you in January or February. Last minute addition of a 13, um, a Brian Moran from CorridorOrchardWiFi.com, who I don't see, um, came he sent a proposal, and I, <clears throat> I haven't read it. He, he wants to sign or something? Or? Yeah, he wanted to place a sign downtown um, advertising that they are offering free Wi-Fi in the downtown area. Is that the PUD that's offering that? No, it's a, no. he's a private operator, and he has a map of his of the area. It's actually better than the PUD. Um, I think you can also see it right here in City Hall. I'm trying to look. But <clears throat> I guess he just wants to be able to tell people that this Wi-Fi is available. 
Um, it is a private thing. He's looking for sponsors. Did he say where he wants the signs to go? Or? He said that he wanted it downtown, not too far from the foot ferry. You mean he, did, he didn't bring us a proposal? He did not. He just... We don't have a... I think he sounded very inflexible. If the committee had a recommendation, he would be willing but, to... So we don't know what the sign's going to look like. Well, we don't know... It's in his thing We don't know emailed. the... Uh, I'd like to see a proposal of what he oh, wants yeah. to do well, with the other thing, those signs. The other thing we have, and, and my hesitation on it, is the whole sign code issue. I'm not inclined to get very deep in a project when we're redoing our sign code. We've already mm -hmm. had discussions earlier today where, so, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so I guess that's on our next agenda, but. Our Wi-Fi isn't working. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Surprising. Okay. Um, then I will reach out to him and let him know that we can bring forward a proposal to this committee. Formalize his proposal. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess we want him to pick locations because I don't think he selected locations. So I was unclear what he, where he wanted it to go. Um, so. Why does he? Because he's looking for sponsors of it. Well, I think from what I read, and I can't pull up now because our Wi-Fi is so bad, is that he wanted, um, he just wanted to let people know that it's available. Um, and we did not have yeah. any other solutions. He could go to the POBSA. I mean, they could be in store windows. Exactly. Yeah, he yeah, could yeah. put up signs yeah. in store windows. I mean, there's a lot of marketing I, I, I opportunity. Prefer, I prefer that myself. Yeah, and I, I mean, our current code doesn't, you know, the intent was not to allow private signs in the right of way. Right. Whether that changes or not, it, it's going to be very complicated because, um, and, and just a little background on what we're looking at, is there are cases that talk about the traditional public forum and being able to, you know, with political signs and other things, that that has to be allowed. But at the same time, now that we can't differentiate between political signs and commercial signs, you if you're going to allow anything in the right of way, you're also allowing commercial signage in the right of way. And so we're trying, this is one of the biggest obstacles to update it. Yeah. I just forwarded it to you. Yeah. And so I'm, I would be concerned about, about taking, few, you know, I, I'm reluctant to allow extensive signage in the right of way, uh, permanent signage especially, because if you allow something like this, you also allow commercial signage. We're opening a can of worms. Yeah, yeah. you can. It's basically, I don't think he had a specific location. I think he just wanted to ask for. I, I think there's a great solution here is that I think put it in the business windows. Mm -hmm. That would be, yeah. He's got sponsors that are businesses. Yeah, exactly. And there's, um, you know, he may not have a lot of marketing skills and thinks that the sign is what he needs, but he can even do little postcards and have them handed out. I mean, there's any <coughs> number of things he could do. So. With that, is there anything else for public properties this morning? Okay, then we will adjourn. And do we need to reset the recording? Yeah, yeah we have a five minute break. Okay, I'd be perfect. Okay, this is not.